Well, welcome everyone to tonight's online community forum to talk about the coronavirus and how it is impacting people in our community. My name is Pamela Duncan and I am the president and CEO of Metropolitan Development Council. I am joined today by my friend and colleague, Twina Nobles, president and CEO of the Tacoma Urban League with whom we are partnering uh, for this series of conversations. And we have a special surprise also with us tonight. And for these conversations going forward is Amanda Westbrook. You may know Amanda from her, her role as the host of City Line on TV Tacoma. She will serve as our facilitator for these meetings beginning tonight. Welcome to the conversation, Amanda. Thank you, Pam. And yes, welcome, Amanda. Tonight's conversation is the sixth in a series of discussions where we are diving into the different ways that the coronavirus is impacting Tacoma and Pierce County. And tonight, we will follow up on last week's panel discussion about the disproportionate impacts of COVID-19 on communities of color, both here in Tacoma, across Washington State, and nationally. Thank you, Tuana. We'll be here for the community throughout the COVID-19 crisis with new conversations every Monday evening at 5 p.m., except next Monday, which will be Memorial Day. We will be taking that off to honor those who uh, are in service for our country or, or who have been in service for our country. Um, the mo most important message throughout the series of the conversations is that there is hope for our community. Our focus is to create space in each meeting to talk about the resources and things we can all be doing, but we'll make our best effort to do the list on our allotted time. Um, your conversation, you can submit questions by being addressed to our speakers using the question and answer function in Zoom. And again, we'll try to consider every uh, question, but we'll make our best effort to get through this list in the next hour and a half. As a matter of housekeeping, uh, for security of everyone on this call, everyone's mic has been muted and we are not allowing everyone to share their faces on the video. We have also disabled the chat function. So please submit your questions to our moderator through the Q&A. Our panelists for tonight, and I am so excited about this, are Pam and Twina. I know both of you have heard from the community since last week's discussion, and you have a number of questions you have heard as well as you simply wanted to weigh in on last week's discussion and the conversation of this topic to address this as Metropolitan Council and Tacoma Urban League are doing to counteract the disproportionate impacts of COVID-19 in our own community. Thank you both so much for the roles that you have and what you do for our community and that you are here today as CEO and president of Tacoma Urban League and MDC. All right, so let's start with the first question we have because as I watched last week's uh, segment, that was an amazing segment. I wanted more time. I wanted to crawl inside my laptop and sit down with everybody and talk for hours. And I think a lot of people felt the same way. So here's a question for both of you. And um, Twina, why don't you go first? What are some of the concrete steps that people can take to change the story of how this pandemic is disproportionately impacting communities of color? Thank you for that question. I definitely believe um, education is going to be real critical. We as communities of color, you know, myself as a black woman, the black community, we have to make sure we're educating ourselves on everything from the reopening phases to um, learning more about the virus and how it impacts us and how it impacts our community. Um, I think it will be real important that we're doing our part to wear our masks, to wash our hands, and to um, um, to stay home when, when we need to stay home. It also will be important to share our stories. So a huge part of the disproportionate 
impacts that we're experiencing are due to structural racism. And it will be important for us here in Tacoma and in Pierce County to share stories with community-based organizations, those of us who are doing advocacy around supporting small businesses and how CARES Act funding should be spent. I personally at Tacoma Urban League want to hear stories and begin to um, listen to the narrative so I know how to advocate to government, to elected officials, to public health um, about what's happening with folks who are trying to get tested, um, trying to receive health care and running to some of the same um, systemic barriers of not being listened to, being sent home. So I encourage folks to share their stories. Um, it will be really important for those of us organizations that do advocacy work to call out the injustices. So that is going to be one step that we can take so we we don't lose our voice in this process um so share your story you can contact me at tacoma urban league and just let me know you know what's happening so i am better equipped when i'm talking to folks who are making decisions learn about the virus um advocate for your health when you are receiving health care i know it's problematic because there is um, provider bias and there's this continuation of people of color not being listened to, but we have to make sure that we use our voice. I think the other piece that we'll have to focus on as much as culturally for many communities of color, we love our family, we live with our family, we congregate with our family. Um, we have to just keep in mind that we only get our, our nuclear family to hang, out, to hang out with and to hang on to um, in the short term until we can get our entire community um, better. So I think also um, taking seriously the physical and social distancing, distancing which is, is culturally very difficult. Um, and right now we, we long for each other's comfort. So um, wash your hands, wear your mask, get tested if you can. The city of Tacoma is offering testing the next several days. I know Harmon Law is offering testing. Um, advocate for yourself to your healthcare provider. Stay educated on what reopening means. Stay educated on this virus and reach out to those of us who are running community-based organizations so we can hear your story and advocate for you as well. Mm -hmm. Well said. Pam, would you weigh in from your MDC point of view of steps that you think people can take um, to counteract the effects of this pandemic? Absolutely. Everything that Twina already said, I wholeheartedly echo. I, can't, I cannot downplay the importance of the physical distancing. Um, we are, as Twina said, we are so very much um, a community of folks who really long to be uh, around one another, um, but we cannot downplay the importance of the physical distancing social distancing, we can still be social, we can be sociable. These are the ways that we do it now. It's very different. It will continue to look different, but we have to understand and uh, respect that it's important that we are wearing our masks, that we are only going out when it is absolutely uh, important to do so, so that we can help to stave off the uh, rising, the increasing um, occurrence of the coronavirus. And then I will say that as um, MDC is a community action agency, we are uh, established within the community as part of a statewide network and also as a national network to address the issues within the community, we definitely need to know what the impacts are. We are seeing impacts within our own staff family, but within the entire community because we have an obligation to elevate those uh, issues as well through our network. And so for MDC as one of the largest community action agencies within the state, and also serving uh, definitely one of the most diverse populations. It's very important that we know how folks are being impacted. So as we continue to have these conversations every Monday, with the exception of next Monday, it's critical for people to weigh in. We have had people email us and say, hey, this was very enlightening for us. We need to just continue to hear from folks, make certain that you, Pam and Twina, that you talk about this, you elevate this, so that we know what the issues are within our community. 
Thank you, Pam, for that. So when we talk about those issues in this community, um, I don't think that we can talk about the issues enough. We can't say it enough. So what can be done to mitigate these issues in Tacoma and Pierce County? And I'd like you first to um, talk about the issues that you see and also that have been brought to your attention. So I want everybody to feel like we're all, that they are on the same page in the sense of acknowledging issues and then what can we do? I'd like to uh, take that. Uh, we talked about this um, in part, in large part last week, as we talked about the disproportionate impacts of coronavirus on uh, communities of color and what really began to um, bubble up very organically from that conversation is that it's more of coronavirus is one more stressor in the black and brown community. So let's just talk about in terms of the impacts on physically on folks. Uh, folks, uh, black folks, brown folks, uh, red folks, non-white communities tend to have a, a higher um, incident of underlying health concerns that make us more vulnerable, more at risk for contracting coronavirus. That's the first thing. And so because of the environmental issues that have contributed to folks being more at risk, we absolutely have to talk about and address the, um, the ways that our environment lends to folks being uh, more susceptible to coronavirus. That's a big, huge uh, task to take on. It means talking about um, the why there is such a, a disproportionate amount of um, fast food restaurants and urban areas where there tend to be more uh, folks who are non-white living in them. Why is it that it's so uh, much more difficult for black and brown folks to access healthcare? And we know that that's um, an even greater issue right now. And that's just starting to touch the tip of the iceberg. We are talking about um, institutionalized systems that have been uh, deliberately designed to, to benefit white folks and to be to the detriment of black and brown communities. So there's a lot of layers to the issues that we are um, seeing right now in the community. But the first thing is absolutely to acknowledge that they exist, to talk about them, and then to uh, begin to work on them uh, through advocacy and educating others. Well said. Twyna, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. Yeah, and I agree with Pam. I think we, we have to be honest about the fact that racism is embedded in the structure of this country. We have to be honest about um, the disproportionate numbers of um, people of color who are on the front lines, who are more likely to be essential workers. Um, our communities are always more vulnerable. Um, and we have to, you know, when we think about mitigating um, the, the impact, again, we have to talk about the racial wealth gap. We have to talk about um, many of our families who are um, not accessing um, these prosperous careers and, and making a livable wage and why that exposes us disproportionately to um, uh, living situations and jobs where our health is more likely to be impacted. So we carry, um, you know, one of the highest chronic disease burdens and are more likely to have asthma and, and diabetes. And, um, and these are fights that we have been fighting for a long time. And it's really important for the community to understand communities of color are not disproportionately impacted by COVID-19 because um, they're doing something wrong. It is because of racism and discrimination. Um, and even when we, when we say things like it's because of where we live and where we work, it is because of redlining and continued structural um, discrimination. So it is the way that this country has placed and treated and continues to treat people of color. And this disease simply um, is, is 
exposing information that many of us already knew, um, but it's it's being highlighted and um, magnified in in some of the most hurtful ways. And so I'm, you know, when you said, what are we hearing kind of on the ground? This is um, the loss of business and disproportionately impacting you know, um, businesses owned by people of color. This is, you know, creating food insecurity in our communities. Um, more folks are needing help with mortgages and rental assistance. And um, I'm sure we'll, we'll get to, you know, what resources are out there. But in order for us to mitigate the impact, we have to know the real data and the real information. We have to be honest about, you know, there are almost 11% of African Americans, you know, confirmed with COVID-19, confirmed cases in Pierce County. Um, and the health department has published this information, but it's, you can you see where, you know, almost 6% of the Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander communities confirmed cases compared to um, white communities. Um, and the, the numbers are disproportionate for the percentage of the population that um, is occupied by by people of color. So to mitigate it, we have to understand the data and the barriers and the structural racism that prevents us from getting tests, being listened to. And when we know the facts, we can get closer to um, providing solutions. And, you know, we'll continue working together as community to help to provide those, um, those, those uh, solutions. But, um, Number one, we have to know the data and know the information and tell our communities it is not their fault. It is because of the nasty, hateful history of this country. And when there is a crisis of this size, it just magnifies um, those disproportionate negative impacts. So well said. And I want to remind our audience that um, they can uh, send their questions and their comments through our Q&A. Um, and I, I'm sure this is stirring up some thoughts and we desperately want to hear them, especially with um, uh, Twina and Pam here. You know, as I want to say, Twina, as you were talking, what came into mind was I was watching the, I think it was the, it was the second or third, it was the millennial uh, conversation that Straight Talk had, which made me cry. And there was a beautiful young woman named Simone. And she said that all of her life, she was, had heard, there's never gonna be money for this. There's no money for people of this color in that program. And then she said, then suddenly COVID-19 comes along and there's tons of money. And yet we still don't have access to it. And if that doesn't paint the picture, I don't know what does. And that makes me very emotional to hear, honestly. It takes me back to, I mean, three consecutive nights when small business funding was released from the federal government and um, state and county. And we at the Urban League were frantically trying to get IDLE and PPP funds to businesses and listening to the many barriers and just finding it um, unacceptable that we can say, oh, we have money to help, but it's this dog eat dog, first come first serve. The folks who need it the most still don't have access to it. Um, and, and we actually, as um, the Tacoma and Seattle Urban Leagues, we actually put a letter together and sent it to financial institutions and elected officials. And we said, you know, we're gonna continue doing this direct service. We're gonna do what we can to support families. But in the meantime, we have to let you all know that you have to take into account um, underserved communities and you have to think about almost always when there is a or let me not say almost always but too too often when there is a business of color they have a smaller staff and fewer funds and a smaller budget and are self-managing all of these parts and to add this burden of you're in crisis and you're desperate and you have to beat everybody to get this funding is just not fair. And I had Jewish friends, black friends, all like so many different folks tell me my bank is not participating. My bank closed before I could sit down at my computer to complete the application. They had, they were overwhelmed with the amount of applicants. And so we definitely stepped up on the advocacy piece to say, this is unacceptable. And I commend folks like the city of Tacoma who, when they did the rental assistance, 
kept the window open, utilized the lottery, set aside funds for communities of color. And I know it's hurtful for folks who still aren't recognizing their own privilege and what it means to be a person of color and, and what it means to be disadvantaged and how this society was set up to um, perpetuate that. And there were lots of folks who were like, why do people of color need money set aside to help them? Um, and I think that's a good question. Why do people of color have to have money set aside to help them? Why is this a, a, a country that continues to um, put our communities deeper in the hole, even when it steps up to find funding to help? And we still um, end up on the bottom and under-resourced. My question is, why? So we have so much work to do. And I mean, I spent several like back-to-back -back nights crying because I wish there, I mean, we helped a lot of businesses. I actually um, will be looking at those final numbers. And so I know folks were able to get um, PPP funds and we're waiting to hear from the state, like who got the emergency grant. Um, so we did some incredible work providing technical assistance, but not enough not enough because there, you know, the, there, there wasn't enough funds for, for us to help the amount of people who were looking to be served. And that to me is unacceptable. So well said. Um, there is a question that um, uh, one of our uh, very listening audience wants to talk about. And, but I want to hear Pam, your response to this because Tawina, has such a, a, a bird's eye view of businesses and professionals. And here you are, Pam Duncan, over on MDC, and you have underserved people, people who are homeless, people who are addicted. Um, and um, the love and the help is the same. And also the reasons why are the same, but the approach is different. Pam, could you talk a little bit about that? Sure, because here's the thing. Coronavirus is not a respecter of persons. The thing is, the impacts on folks differs. And so my heart has really been heavy as I think about the folks who are underserved, but especially those folks who are not sheltered. So, and I want to be very specific when I talk about that particular part of the uh, community of those who are experiencing homelessness because, and none of it is appropriate, none of, not one aspect of it is good. Some folks are uh, sheltering though in hotels. Some folks are sheltering by couch surfing with relatives and friends, but there are folks who are not sheltered they take shelter inside a doorway of a building. And we can't address enough and fast enough how critical it is to be ensuring that all of our community is being safely sheltered because when you are not being sheltered, you are more exposed and more likely to have those comorbidities that um, increase your risk for be, becoming ill with coronavirus. We, I mean, and every day we learn more and more and more about this virus, how it is impacting folks who weren't even on the radar at first, right? So we have to, my heart really is being torn about how we address the needs of those who are experiencing homelessness, who are unsheltered, because think about it. Where have they gone? Where can they go? We don't know. Where have they gone? Because they didn't get housing. We already know what that situation is like. So I'm very, very concerned about them. And then because MDC is such a large organization, we have almost 200 staff. We have folks who are uh, representative of our entire community, um, socioeconomically speaking, uh, culturally, ethnically speaking, um, beliefs, everything, and they are all being impacted in different ways. And so it's sort of a micro um, view of what is happening in our community. We know that people are at high risk. They are right on the edge of becoming homeless now. 
because their, um, their household incomes have been impacted. Because when we begin to talk about who's most likely to lose their job, it's black and brown folks who are in service industries that have been hard hit. Um, they're the frontline folks who we don't typically talk about when we talk about who's on the front line. We talk about, and we are grateful for those who are in the healthcare business, firemen, police officers, but also those folks who are delivering food to us, for us, who are working in restaurants that are still open. They're being impacted. When people are um, placed in a position where they become behind on their, uh, their house note, their rent, whatever it is, that begins that cracking of the infrastructure for them. And whether um, landlords are gracious and they say, hey, hey, we will allow you, we're not going to press you, we're not, all of this has to be paid. And how does that get paid? So, and we also know the data also support that the folks who are at greatest risk, who tend to get evicted first or at a disproportionate rate, I'll put it like that, are black and brown communities. And then you have an eviction on your record. So then where do you go when housing is already tough to get? So these are the types of things that we are paying attention to and that we know we have to get in front of. And so Twina and I, by partnering, we're having the conversations about, okay, so what does this mean? How do we take this crisis and not let this good crisis go to waste? How do we um, partner even better and advocate in terms of all of these dollars that are coming in, like Simone said a few weeks ago, how do we um, really, um, just really get in front of that and advocate for the folks who are in most in need of it so that we don't, you know, we don't see a repeat of what happened with the Paycheck Protection Program when those who had the attorneys and the finance, great big finance departments that applied and got money right away and then other folks were just left out. Twina, I want to hear what you have to say on the urban professional side of this, but first, I want to put this question out to both of you, and this came over uh, on our Q&A. It's a great question. The question is, what can concerned, caring white folks do? And Twina, I want you to start with that so Pam can rest your voice for a second. <laughs> Thank you. I really appreciate actually how we were how we are facilitating this conversation today because Pam and I, you know, and the, the three of us, we kind of talked about um, it is important even for you, Amanda, to be here um, because Black folks in other communities of color need to lead these conversations. Those who are being most impacted need to be at the table. Um, need to be you know, creating their own tables and, and need to, like, like Pam and I did, need to create their own platforms to tell their stories, to lead the stories. But although we need to lead in telling our stories and saying what we need um, and what's going to best serve us, this is all of our conversation to have. One thing that really turned me off is it seemed like folks were all on board to stay home and stay safe until we saw who was really being impacted by COVID-19. And then it, it seemed like it was interpreted as like, oh, black folks, folks of color, then let's open up, let's, let's get this thing going. And that, that is, is, is a heartbreaking message to send. So what white allies can do, you know, white folks who, who care is to make sure that you recognize that for every black and brown person that's not served, that's not tested, that dies, that is confirmed, this is all of our public health issue. So it is the government and the public health um, sector's 
responsibility for keeping us safe, keeping us informed, providing what we need as a community. But this is all of our conversation to have and all of our responsibility. So what I recommend is to not sit back and say, oh, it's those people who are being impacted. No, it's our community that's being impacted. So show up and sit at the tables and use the data and use the information to be an advocate. Don't sit back and say, okay, I'm good. The, um, you know, the data is declining for folks who look like me. Stay concerned, stay vigilant, stay a strong voice because this is our entire community. And as Pam said, it's black and brown folks who are on the front line, who are providing the essential services, who are keeping us comfortable. We need all of us. We need every single community, community member. So recognize that this is our pandemic problem to continue to solve, to figure out, to support. Um, so show up and use your voice. That's, that's my, my best advice <laughs> that I have to give. Beautifully said. Now, Pam, I'd like you to answer that same question of what can caring white folks do from a MDC perspective of when we uh, encounter those who are not sheltered or we see them on the street um, or they don't have a mask on, what are some very tangible ways that we can help? I think you have your mute on. I, I am unmuted now. So certainly we all are aware of the uh, shortage of PPE, the personal protective equipment. And we have um, a movement, um, a grassroots movement underway. Folks are making uh, masks to distribute to folks and that is greatly appreciated. And what we know is that a mask is better than no mask at all right and let's save the surgical masks for the healthcare workers so um, we already have staff in our organization who are um, are making masks and my assistant can hand delivered uh, a big bundle of masks that she had made um, today um, so that's certainly one thing that is one way also to if you are encountering folks who are on, who are unsheltered, they are um, on the streets. You know what? It doesn't hurt to carry um, care packages in the trunk of your car um, or even just one in your backpack if you are a, uh, a walker and um, have some essential items in there like wipes and um, toothpaste and um, other things that, you know, daily essential things that we just take for granted. That's definitely a helpful thing to do. And then before people begin thinking about, okay, I'm going to donate all of my gently used items of clothing to, um, to anyone. So just no, not yet. What we need um, is that cadre of volunteers who are ready to come together and be thought partners with us and to be those allies so that as we are talking to our policy makers, um, this is not just a, um, a one-sided, it is a community approach. It is the community embracing the issue and saying that we are all in this together. Just as we see the signs all over the place that say, we are in this together, we're going to come through this together. As it pertains to the disproportionate impacts, again, we are all in this together. We are all impacted by this, even if we don't think we are. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, we have another question from our audience and this is, this is just as wonderful as the first one. And here it is. Now that we have experienced with the impact of pandemic, can we now put procedures in place that will be able to help our people that are high risk? An example of a procedure would be to partner and collaborate with the necessary entities to provide empty buildings ready to assist with homelessness? Yeah, this question actually really excites me because it speaks, 
I mean, that's, that's, that's one part of it. The, um, how can we partner together? I think, yes, we need to make sure that we have um, spaces for um, our community members experiencing homelessness. But as we start talking about opening up, I'm really, I am so excited to put on my advocacy hat and to help with resources because that is um, where I really like to help. Um, and so I want to share some resources for folks today. And, and Pam can speak more about um, our unsheltered community if she would like. But I want to encourage folks that for sure Tacoma Urban League is working really hard um, to track um, resources for reopening. And that includes PPE, that includes education. What I am now thinking about is um, I'm excited for businesses to get back up and running. I don't want us to do anything too quickly. So it is important to follow the guidance of our governor to pay attention to our um, reopening and all the phases. But I have even started reading um, reopening in phases from other cities. I was reading New Orleans and taking a look at what's required, how are people fined, how are folks held accountable. And so if you are in the state of Washington and your employer is not providing you with adequate protection or resources or education, you're not social distancing, um, it's really important that you visit um, workingwa.gov, um, I believe, workingwa.gov. But if you go to Working Washington, um, that is where you can um, get some information for workers' rights. If you have concerns, um, see a business or see someone that is out of compliance or um, want to make a complaint, I do want to um, provide a disclaimer that the next site that I'm going to give you um, is a site where someone could do a public records request and some of that information could be um, partially or fully exposed. So I, um, if that is something that is of concern, then this may not be the route, but coronavirus.wa.gov is where you can make a complaint to say, I'm seeing things in my community that are out of compliance. I am seeing businesses that are not, not following what the governor has asked us to do, that has not following what our, our county or city has um, mandated. So those are some resources for workers, for community members, but also for businesses. I have been really following our local um, Tacoma Pierce County Chamber of Commerce, and they have an entire site that's called um, Back to Work, and it's part of their rapid response initiative, and businesses can go in, or individuals, I just have been reading um, since I run a business and as a community member, but there is guidance for manufacturers, for um, medical services, um, dentistry, for retail. So if you are looking for where is the guidance, where is the information that tells me as a business owner, or where, where is information that tells me as an employee, as a professional, as a frontline worker, um, what should be happening on my job site? So there, there's a, a, there are full proposals of job site guidance and recommendations on masks um, for business owners, especially. It talks through challenge, challenges that you may need to mitigate, things that you need to think about, ways to not retaliate and discriminate against someone when they say, hey, you're not, you should be giving me a mask. You're my employer. Um, so um, there's also some information um, about the construction roundtable that the, the governor put together. But if you are curious and, and um, wanting more information about where we're opening, but now what? How do I keep myself safe? How do I keep my employees safe? Um, how do I keep my children safe? And I'm excited to learn more about the guidance that will be provided um, from OSPI as we think about school in the fall and just sharing spaces again um, but go to the, the um, Tacoma Pierce County um, Chamber website, take a look at the Health Department's website, Working Washington, um, coronavirus.wa.gov. Those are places where you can start getting some of your questions answered about where we're opening, but now what? How do we keep our, our, all of our community safe, but especially our most vulnerable community members? Well said. Pam, I'd like to ha hear your thoughts on this. I know, I know, I know. <laughs> the thing that I thought about, and Twina, wow, thank you. That was some great information that you provided. As you were speaking, I was thinking about the governor's order uh, to, to stay home and to stay safe. Um, and what struck me, the irony of that, the, um, here's the, the crux of the, the, the matter, is that there are folks who cannot stay home because they have no home to stay at. And so that has um, really elevated, again, we cannot continue to ignore the impacts of um, 
what it means to be unsheltered, I should say. And so we have to, um, as a community, come up with solutions for that. And as the uh, person who issued that question asked, um, so what can we do with the, uh, the properties that are around that could be uh, repurposed into um, housing or at the very least shelter? And so that is an issue that all of us who are in the housing business. MDC um, has um, almost 200 units of housing um, that are provided for, that are affordable housing, but we are not a housing developer. And so it's really a critical question for the, the city and the county and the various housing um, affinity groups to begin addressing what does it mean now that we are in this place where we know life will never be the same. Um, as a uh, board member of the Washington Low Income Housing Alliance, I will be raising those issues there, as well as locally, the Tacoma Pierce County Affordable Housing Consortium. What do we do to be focused on providing more housing for folks who don't have a place to live? So that's one thing. And the other thing I wanted to say, and Rob, just nod your head. Can I share a screen? Can I share a screen? I'm gonna see if I can share a screen um, so that you can see the indicators that the governor is using because there's one in particular that's very critical to talk about. I cannot host disabled. I'm not able to show the, the screen. So, um, I'll talk through it. And so there's, uh, the governor has the COVID-19 risk assessment dashboard, and it's the data that's being used to um, help determine when, how we uh, have our economic recovery. And there's one indicator in particular that um, I really want to elevate, and this is the risk to vulnerable populations. And the indicators that are used on that one um, are the number of outbreaks, and long-term care facilities per week and demographic and equity data. So it doesn't, um, it doesn't talk about, it doesn't reference what it means to be in a shelter and how those are very vulnerable uh, populations who are basically living in shelters. And then the demographic and equity data, which is not um, specific, but we know that this is where um, it's so critical to pay attention to because of the folks who are more likely to become um, impacted, affected, infected um, by coronavirus. So when I think about what are things that we can do even more of, I am curious about how um, we as a community um, based organization, and I mean we collectively, how we might be able to provide um, a venue where folks can get tested and where people in our own communities can be getting tested. I'm willing to open up our MDC. We have um, we have inpatient services, so we have healthcare workers already who are providing services right now, even as we speak. And I just want to give a big clap and shout out to them because of what they are doing. They're on the front lines. But we are already equipped. We could be um, providing testing services so that folks know, um, you know, yay or nay, what's going on with them and with their households. So that's one of the things that I would elevate that we um, would be able to do and take some of the burden off of perhaps the health department or other organizations. We could help with that. So well said. And, and Toyna, I can see you nodding and I know you want to add something else to this. Um, we have another question and I think it really ties in beautifully to this. And the question is about um, what is MDC doing? And I want to also throw it out to Tacoma Urban League. Um, when it comes to undocumented 
individuals. And that's another vulnerable population. I mean, when you are terrified of coming forward, even walking in and giving your name, or, or uh, language is a barrier, um, you are, 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 are just gonna get so sick, it's unbelievable. So what are some things that MDC is doing to pave the way for that vulnerable population and of course, Tacoma Urban League as well? Sure. That's a, um, a very important question. I was just uh, listening to the news and heard that the federal administration had closed off the border, the uh, southern um, border, to people who are seeking um, safety and asylum here in this country, but at the same time deported, like I think, 20,000 people in April. Um, so it's, it's very critical. Our services are, um, what we offer, we offer to everyone. So whether it is the inpatient services or if it is um, educational services um, for, especially for children or folks who are in college, people who are seeking um, assistance for rental, um, their rent or their utilities or weatherization, we provide those services to everyone. I will say there are instances where we are restricted because of the nature of the funding. So if we receive funding um, that comes indirectly from HUD, then we are required to um, check um, the documented status. However, we do not, um, report we are we consider ourselves to be a, a safe um, environment for folks to to come to and as a community i would say that we all definitely need to do more um, we are very willing to partner with any other organization to provide um, services and help and assistance for anyone twina Yep, and the same here. So we have, um, we don't have any particular programs that are um, exclusive to undocumented community members or immigrant community members, but we have many unrestricted funds and are serving those community members um, um, any, any, any day, anyone that reaches out to us so they can still benefit from our um, transportation support, any of our um, virtual classes or online or services. So we are definitely um, advocating for, I mean, the black community to me is, you know, black, it's, it's African, it is black and brown folks that we are going to continue to advocate for in urban community members. So we will continue with the advocacy and providing services um, to, you know, any community member that comes to us and is looking um, for help. Twina, you read my mind because this next question uh, from our listening audience has that sense of advocacy in it. And this is the question. And this is for both you, Pam and Twina. I'm a single mother of seven, a paralegal and law student, BSU member, and a member of the Black Collective, and a staff member at college. Amazing. I am still young in age. I have recently been diagnosed with heart failure. What are some thoughts and options for people like me that still have to leave the home to get food, household items, and the possibility of returning to the workplace? I'm worried. Oh, first off, bless you, woman. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Pam, you wanna take this and give Twina a, a chance to think about this? So as I was listening to you speak, Amanda, I, was, I began to uh, actually ideate about how can we, um, MDC, MDC and Tacoma Urban League partner together to uh, provide services to people's homes. Um, that was the first thing that, that came to my mind. And, and I'm in the full spirit of transparency there are many things that are even now continuing to just bubble up organically. And it's like, hey, we could be doing that. So I'm not going to just sit on um, listening to something and 
um, not take action if something occurs to me. I think that's one of the first things that came to my mind is how could we um, serve where she where she is because we always say we meet people where they are and this is an excellent time to um, really put our money where our mouth is so to speak and then wow there are just so many um layers to that that um i, I and i as well applaud um this young woman this mother um keeping her household together, um, having a, um, a vision, a focus, and um, working through, uh, this is what she wants to do in life. And so I would say there's, uh, we provide, again, um, community uh, focused services such as energy assistance and uh, rental assistance if there is a need for those items. Um, I, I would really like to hear more about what are the specific areas that she uh, would need assistance with. So I'm going to turn it over to Tawina. I'm going to um, just kind of let that mull in my mind for a little bit and I might come back and weigh in some more. Yep, my sentiments um, exactly. One, thank you for your sacrifice, for your commitment, for waking up each day um, to give and to serve. My question as well is how can we help you? What can we do to lift the burden? I think um, my recommendation to all folks is, you know, those of us who um, are in a position to do more, to give more, um, that we do so, that we help our neighbors um, in ways that allow us to still physically um, and, and socially distance ourselves, um, but to offer a helping hand where it's possible. So I, I want, you know, you can feel free to, to, to message me, email me, and let me know if there are things that we can do, all the ways that, that Pam said, if there are resources um, that Tacoma Urban League can um, help your family with, we would love to, to do that. The other thing that I wanna say that's really important is you are giving to your children and giving to your place of employment um, and you know, even pursuing your dreams and your goals is to make sure that you don't forget about you. So you have an underlying health problem that you have to take care of. And so folks around you, and I say this, my son is 15 and um, he's, he's healthy, but he is, is, um, has an opportunity to work and he's choosing to work. He wants to you know, be out the house, his, his job is, um, is in a restaurant and he, he feels like he's able to um, make money and give back and, and you know, be with, with other folks um, who are serving um, in essential jobs. But I tell my son this same thing, you have to be your greatest advocate. So you wear your mask and then you encourage folks around you to wear a mask as well, to make sure that you're washing your hands. But I, what I tell my son, and I'm, and I'm saying this um, to you as well, is you have to champion your health, um, Candace. You, you have to um, let folks know that um, you got to take care of you, and so you have to hold them accountable for following the rules. And, you know, you have Pam and I here, and if there are ways that we can help you, but right now, one of the number one things that I'm telling folks who have any type of, of health condition is you have to do your very best to advocate to make sure um, if it's taking medicine or taking a blood pressure or taking a temperature, um, getting your rest, um, whatever it is that you will need to take care of yourself, you can't forget about you. So you, you, and you can't serve any of those other folks, not even your babies, if you don't take care of you. So do your very best to recognize um, this is a pandemic and you are more vulnerable. And so take care of you first, put your own oxygen mask on first, and then you can show up and serve the rest of the folks in your community. And we will do our best to help you as well. So Miss Pam, what are you thinking about? I was just smiling at, and um, <laughs> I realized I had it on mute again. I said, amen to that, um, Twina. And um, something else that I would encourage you to do. So, um, just as Twina said, please feel free to reach out to both of us um, and we will see if we can um, put that information up at the end of this conversation. If not, we will just share our uh, email addresses with you. But also, I, one of the things that I have found has really been helpful for me is to get 
an accountability partner as well to help you to make certain that you take care of yourself. And um, that person can be that person, hey, you um, two can get together, do a social distancing walk or do a uh, check-in um, on one another. And then that way uh, you're building up your community of support as well, because that's very, very important. And I just wholeheartedly echo what Twina said about you have to take care of yourself first. Absolutely, you know, and, and as I was going through um, the previous uh, straight talk, and, and even I believe it was this last one, we were, there was a conversation about um, brown and black community and their families and what this shelter in place has done in the sense of support groups of people that you no longer can be around that are there on a day-to-day -day basis to lift you up. And um, I just want to say a prayer for Candace, but also to say she is so hooked in to some of the best groups that she can be hooked into. And I think that that is so important when we're talking about trying to find the best sources for help is to know who to go to what is out there um and i think that she is well just amazing we have another question and boy do we have some great questions coming up and um tawana i want to start with you on this one and then pam i want you to come in from behind um this question is from deborah deborah says another concern is that we all know there is a promising vaccine being researched and provided by Moderna. Do we know if people of color are involved in participating in this vaccination program? We need to stay abreast of the day-to-day -day information so that we can be more involved right away. Yeah, I don't know if communities of color are being tested um, for that vaccine, but you are correct about staying on top of the information and the education. And, and many of us, well, um, I fully disclose, I don't have TVs or cable in my house, so I um, try to reduce some of the noise um, at least a little bit, but I do recommend you finding trusted sources. Here in Pierce County, I definitely recommend the coronavirus website, so coronavirus.wa.gov, and the health department. Um, Dr. Anthony Chen presented this past weekend at the Tacoma Pierce County Black Collective and reported that there are you know, lots of folks not only testing and um, experimenting, but folks selling products um, as tests and as ways that you can um, do rapid testing at home and prick your finger and that you focus on going to trusted um, sources for information, but also for tests. That you go to a hospital, to a clinic and refrain from um, purchasing items online um, or participating in anything that is not coming from your healthcare provider. Um, but I, I just recommend getting, you know, up-to-date and accurate information from the health department, from the coronavirus site itself. And um, yeah, I wish I had more information about who's being tested um, in those clinics, but I don't. Um, but it's good information and maybe I'll do a little more research. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Pam, what do you know about this? Um, Similarly, I am not aware that there is a concerted effort or targeting um, communities of color for the vaccine. So that is something that we, um, number one, we need to know about and we definitely should also be advocating for because we know of the uh, disproportionate impacts. Um, and I just want to read something that um, one of my board members shared that um, we need to ensure that we are talking to our legislators and others and the health departments and the Centers for Disease Control to make certain that our voices are being heard as people of color. That is so right. Thank you so much, Lewis, for that, um, that statement. So I want to move on to uh, a question, and, and I want to I want to bring up what Candace said. The last thing she said in her comment was, "I'm worried," mm 
-hmm. And we know that worried, you dig deep, it's fear-based. So I want to ask the question, I want to hear from the two of you. Can you talk a little bit about the intersection between behavioral health Absolutely. and communities of color? What should communities and organizations be attentive to, uh, both because of COVID-19 and boy, especially after COVID-19? Pam, do you want to start with that? Absolutely. And I'm going to start with the last part of your statement. I don't I don't know that there is an after COVID-19. I think there is a post-pandemic um, life, um, but not an after COVID-19, not for the foreseeable future. We are still in that state of learning so much about the impacts of this disease and on various parts of the community. That in itself, causes anxiety. There is so much um, worry, um, concern. Um, it, it has a, um, it's traumatic. This whole experience for all of us has been a traumatic one. It has been unprecedented. And if you have a safe place to be, we have safe places to be. We are in our homes, we are with our families, our loved ones, and um, at least we don't have that as a worry um, compared to folks who don't have a safe place to be. When you couple, when you begin to stack on, where do I stay or what's gonna happen to my income? Or if I go outside, can I breathe in coronavirus and will I get sick? And what about my um, more vulnerable family members? And what about this? And what about this? And what about this? That begins to take a toll on your mental well-being. And so we have to pay attention to that. We also know, once again, the most underserved folks as, we, uh, as it pertains to behavioral health concerns are black and brown communities. And so, and we have heard throughout the conversations we've been having, that's been one of those common threads that I'm concerned, I don't know what's going to happen. And so we strongly urge folks to, um, again, to take care, self-care is very important. Also, MDC provides outpatient counseling, and so we can do that um, virtually. And so if people have concerns and they need to uh, talk with someone, reach out to us and we can provide uh, behavioral health counseling to address that. And it's not enough that we are providing that. This is something that we have to be cognizant of, that this is going to have long-term emotional, mental, financial, spiritual, physical impacts on all of us, and we have to pay attention to that. We have to be um, intentional about addressing um, intentional and proactive about addressing these issues. It means that it's going to change how we show up as organizations in the community. What we determine is important to be addressing. Pre-COVID-19, there, there were, were lists of priorities that we all had that we need to do this and this and this. And right now we need to be taking a good hard look at what now is important and how do we show up in a way that we can be supportive of and value added for our communities. And I want to assure the community that we are doing something. So um, we are, my recommendation is while we may not be able to share the same physical space, Tacoma Urban League in partnership with um, Metropolitan Development Council and its representatives in partnership um, with Peace Community Center in partnership with um, um, Jamad Canley's um, nonprofit organization. We several months ago created a Black Parent a Black Parents Alliance, and it, it has been a place we call it kind of like a Black PTA, but it's where Black folks can go and and talk about our our um, our 
celebration stressors and concerns around educating our scholars, our um, youth, our own children. And we have been so flexible and we've pivoted during COVID-19. And the next three months, including our session yesterday, is focused on behavioral health, um, mental health and wellness. And we have um, black therapists and have been sharing this, this link that I will um, put in a chat box, but we have a link that is multicultural therapists in the state of Washington because we recognize our community is in um, a crisis and experiencing trauma and we cannot do what we have done when there have been other large scale traumatic um, events in our society, which is just shift and move on. So folks who are losing their business and losing their home and um, having their kids home full time for the first time in, in years, being at home with their um, partner, roommate, spouse, circumstances have changed. And so our Black Parents Alliance is offering the next three months a full session on behavioral health and mental health. And yesterday our session was focused on like, what is mental health and how do we look for it? And um, in June, we'll talk about how do we advocate for our children as we think about our kids are home and you wanna talk about stress and trauma and behavioral health. Many of our kids receive services from the public school system and now they are home and somehow we're supposed to figure out what professionals were taking care of. So it's not about, you know, I see all these memes and things online about, well, that's your child and take care of your child. But we live in a system where I am able to send my child to school and use my tax dollars. I pay for this. I pay for a professional to assist me and the academic needs of my children. And so we, we have to tell our families how we can advocate for our children's trauma and experiences and their, and, and their behavioral health. And then in July, we'll focus and shift on self-care and our well-being and techniques for Black folks and adults to overcome stress and trauma, especially during this pandemic and as we are post-pandemic. But I'm, I'm, I'm with Pam on, you know, we have to deal with this stuff and we'll be in it for um, a long time, but I want the community to know that you can go on Facebook, find the Black Parents Alliance. Um, that is one resource, Tacoma Urban Lake, also for young men of color, not just Black youth, really for young men in general. Every Wednesday, every Thursday online is our um, support and mentorship group for young men in elementary, middle, and high school. Our male involvement program is on Zoom and virtually providing support and positivity to young men in our community. We also have a mom and baby support group that every Thursday there are women who are now at home with brand new babies and their families cannot rally around them to give them a breath of fresh air. And if you, um, you know, no shade to anyone who is trying to be a mom and has never been a mom, but for those of us who are mothers, it is difficult to even have family and have support and have a child at home. And to take that village away from our community is um, just, the hardest thing to, to, to think about and to fathom. And so we have to continue to provide support. The only way we can do it right now is virtually, but on Thursdays is our mom and babies of color support group for um, newborns, pregnant um, um, women, toddlers, but it's a place for you to plug in and get support and be told that you are not alone, that we are all in this struggle and we are all in a crisis school and we are all worried and stress and dealing with the trauma, even those of us who are running organizations. So it's a lot to, to hold on to. Um, it's a lot to deal with and navigate, but I wanna reassure folks that you don't have to do it alone. There are some resources, yes, they're virtual, but there are some resources to help our black and brown community. I'm asking you though, to take the step just to tap in. Just tap in. Love that. We have time for this one last question and boy, I think we need more time. because That was great, Tawina. I just have to say that was great. That was great. Yeah, that was great. It was just amazing. And, and on that, that takes a village um, stream. Have, have both of you either individually or together as community part partners talked about how to reach people in communities of color with critical information related to COVID-19. Um, one of the things that comes to mind um, was uh, I was uh, on Facebook and there was an article about how all of these laptops were distributed and it's a beautiful thing, but then there were some families that didn't even have internet 
your parents had no way of even helping their child get on this. So how are they going to get the information to continue that vital education? So how are we getting critical information and answering critical, critical questions to our community of color? Pam, I'll have you start. Mm -hmm, sure. So that's the whole purpose of these conversations. That's the whole reason that we started these conversations. You can tune in to your dial every Monday, 5 p.m. Next week is a holiday, so we're skipping to the next time it'll be in June. But that's the whole reason that we started these conversations because there are tons of resources that are out there. So I am aware that for Tacoma Public Schools, there is a uh, partnership so that um, families can get have that um, access free access to to um, internet to wi-fi but a lot of folks don't know that a lot of families don't know that because they don't even have a way to access the internet to find out that that's a resource right so that's the whole reason that we are bringing these topics to in this forum because we are all in conversations all day long every day we get a ton of emails um we plan to have um, in a future conversation to speak specifically about education and about um, being out of school and what how um, what the resources are to uh, reach to um, to families to communities and for those folks who are on these calls they can turn around and share this information with their networks and their communities as well so that that um, situation about the computers being the laptops being distributed and then you know the the barrier of um, internet service is just one example of um, a myriad of ways that there are barriers that are being encountered in black and brown communities and um, I want to thank you the, to the person who raised that issue because it just reminds us that we have to just be very nimble, very flexible about how we get information out to the community. And I do want to jump in here and let you know that our, our superintendent of Tacoma Schools, Carla Santorno, she jumped in and she said, Tacoma Public School is working with partners to get internet and devices. Our counselors and family liaisons are reaching out personally to families. So we want to say thank you to Carla. Thank you, Carla. And she is always, she is one of the best co-parents I know. She is amazing. But Twina, I want, to, I want you to answer this question too, because you and Pam, you both of you stand on these tremendous mountains. Here's Pam over here looking with all of the, the services for the underserved individuals. And Twina, here you are over here with, with professional business owners, educators, and you share the same problems, but you solve them differently. So what kind of advice do you have in terms of getting critical information out to our community of color? Yep. And I love Carla's response because that's just it. We right now have to work so closely with partners. We just do. And um, our team is on the phone calling. I know I um, have given out my personal cell phone number to more community members than I know. I mean, it's public information, but um, I've given it out to more folks than usual because it, our office is closed. So as we talk about like wanting to increase equity and access, it is really hard when we can't be at the location where folks are used to going to get services. So it definitely breaks my heart that I can't be in my office with my team doing what we're used to doing. But all of our team, and I've let everyone know to call our families to be on the phone. I too think it was um, um, quite the challenge to you know advertise online if you need online resources. But I know that there are partners like Tacoma Public Schools um, who are calling families. We also are working with other partners who are willing to deliver food from local churches to local nonprofits. So for my own comfort level, like Tawana Nobles is staying in a house and I'm not comfortable doing door to door. Um, but I have great team members who they are comfortable doing that. So I stay in my lane and do what brings me comfortability based on my own um, health and preferences and, 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 and what I'm, you know, willing to do, 
but we have team members who are like, I will drop that food off on a doorstep and everyone is um, making more phone calls than we normally would. And, and right now, you know, our office manager, Michelle, checks our voicemail to capture as many messages as possible, but it is challenging. I mean, we even have to, I mean, I pick up the mail at the post office because we're not in our office because we want to be completely respectful of the stay home order and just keep everyone working remotely for as long as, as we can. And, and our business, um, we, we are able to do our work from home. So we are, but to get to the equity piece of how do we stay in communication and get all the needs met? It is, um, it is very challenging. And, and, you know, early on, I even, I stayed in my car and then when there was a, a community member, I told her to go grocery shop for the groceries that you want. I will come in to just pay. And so I went in with my mask and, and gloves and just paid for what she, what she needed. And I sat in my car for like two hours while she, you know, I said, get all the things that you need. And I waited in the parking lot because I didn't want to be out, but I think we're having to step into non-conventional work. Um, but phones, working with partners who have the PPE and the, um, the staff capacity to, to go to homes, to make deliveries, who have additional vehicles with their job. I mean, Pam has over 200 staff members at Tacoma Urban League. We do really incredible work, but there are four people. <laughs> so we have to um, be careful and um, always think about our capacity and what we can realistically do. But we're working with great partners who are helping to broaden our reach um, and broaden our impact. So we, um, to reiterate, are calling more, um, making it, you know, more personal, seeing what individual folks need. I round the clock, will check my email, will respond to folks because I know, I, I don't know if someone is sending me a, a text message or an email that in a short window that they're able to use someone else's phone or use someone else's internet technology. So I try to be really good about getting back to folks in the most responsive way um, to try to, you know, mitigate that, that challenge. But it, we're not able to do our work with the same... Um, efficiency and quality that we did before. I mean, it, the fact that we're not in our office to receive someone's phone call as soon as they um, dial us is, is heartbreaking. So we try to overcompensate by as soon as we get the need, let's solve the problems really quickly. Um, let's respond and get resor resources out in our community. So it's, um, it's not ideal, but with the community, with amazing partners, we, are, we, we know that we're making an impact. Absolutely. So Amanda, um, I just want to say, I want to offer up because I, I love what Carla shared. Carla, I am, um, MDC is very uh, willing and ready, however we can be a partner uh, with TPS to uh, support our children and even beyond because MDC has a countywide footprint. So for any school district, we are, um, more than willing and ready to uh, provide support. And um, I just want to offer up um, my contact info. Um, so my cell phone number for anyone who wants to reach out to me is 253-392-4180. Uh, and my email address is pduncan, D-U-N-C-A-N, at mdc-hope.org. Love that. So I, I'd like uh, Toyna and Pam, we're gonna close here. And we talked about when we opened that the most important thing about Straight Talk is that there is a message of hope. So I would like both of you to uh, close with a message of hope. And Twina, I'll let you go first. I wanna reassure the community that we are in this together. We are working hard and fast to create responses, to push resources forward, to get the information out to our community. And that is on our social media and new websites like TacomaLearns.org with partners like Tacoma Public Schools, Graduate Tacoma, Big Brother, Big Sister. I wanna reassure you that there are organizations who are thinking about the black and brown communities and advocating for just action as we deal with this pandemic. Those of you who can, you can join us in this fight, join us in um, this, this urgent action that's needed right now in our community. You can email me, go to thetacomaurbanleague.org, but 
we're not just working remotely providing the direct service and leaving behind the advocacy and the demanding of better treatment of our community members. We are in this fight. We are leading this fight and looking for every avenue to create change and also um, create better options and opportunities in our community. And Ms. Pam, what's on your heart? The thing that's on my heart that uh, came to my mind immediately when you asked about hope is that hope is what keeps a person alive. It keeps your spirit alive. As long as there is life, there's hope. And so we know that, again, this is something that we are all going through together for the first time in our lives. Um, things will not ever be the same, but there's so much that can be gained by this situation and just being proactive and um, not forgetting the least among us and how we uh, consider how we position ourselves, what I call being where the hockey puck is going to be, not just staying right here, being where the hockey puck is going to be to be able to take care of those in our community. So you heard Tawana talk about how critical it is to be um, advocating. And that's not just for the community-based organizations to do, that's for everyone. It's an obligation that we have as citizens to be advocating for one another. And then also because of our calling, again, as a community action agency, we um, have a three-pronged approach. So we are um, providing the services that I've already talked about, but we are also convening so that there is a space for these conversations and that we will be leading the way and educating about issues that pertain to poverty and how we transition folks from where they are to having a sustainable, healthy uh, life. So Amanda, I just want to say to you, thank you so much. You have just brought such a richness to these conversations and um, we just look forward to future conversations that you will be facilitating. Mm. Well, I just want to say to that, I am honored and I'm humbled to be at this table um, because all voices need to be heard. Um, and as a white woman, it is my job to listen and to do better. That's my job. I want to say thank you to both of you. You both of you are such examples of strength, beauty, wisdom, intelligence. The roles you play in this community are ministries. You guys don't clock out. You wake up at two in the morning and you're thinking about something that we could do better for our community. Oh, don't remind my husband of that, Amanda. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. And for, for that, I can never say thank you enough. I want to say thank you to our people, our, our folks who listened, for those who submitted questions. I want to say thank you to our superintendent, Carla Santorno, to Rob Huff, who is our technical host, who makes this look seamless as long as we keep our fingers off the keyboard. And also to let you know that we will be back on June 1st at 5 o'clock, and no question is off the table here on Straight Talk. So please take care of each other. Much love from us to you. And we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye. Thank you.